At long last we return to the castle of the kangaroo, the stronghold of the spotted quoll, the palace of the platypus, the garrison of the goanna, Australia. Today though we are going to be focusing on a certain group of reptiles, the snakes that make up the genus Morelia, or mostly carpet pythons. So welcome to Into the Wild Australia Part 2, the Morelia Lorian. This is the way. I went into a good amount of detail about Australia and my time there and some of the other animals you might find there in the first Into the Wild video. Oh my god, my hair is so short. So today we're just going to get right into the snakes. Like I said in that aforementioned video, the number of non-venomous snake species is greatly outnumbered by the species of venomous snakes. But since I don't have any taipans or eastern browns or tiger snakes lying around, we're going to talk about some non-venomous snakes I do have. Morelia is one of the most visually diverse and colorfully striking genuses. Genusi? Genuses? Wh whatever. This is one of the most visually striking groups of snakes in Australia. Now, Morelia isn't just all carpet pythons. It's actually made up of a few different species. Some of I have and some I don't. Snakes like the super cool looking rough scaled python or Australia's longest snake species, the massive amistine or scrub python. But since I don't have any of these snake species today, we're going to mostly focus on carpet pythons. In the wild, there are certain morphs and subspecies you'll be able to find, but thanks to captive breeding and genetics and all that other stuff I don't know about breeding reptiles, you get all these crazy colors and patterns on carpet pythons now, and they come in so many different varieties. I have five different Morelia species we're going to talk about today, most of which you actually will be able to find in the wild, the different corners and habitats. They all have very visually striking colors and patterns, but not all the ones we're going to talk about today are actually wild morphs. These snakes are found across Australia and up into Papua New Guinea and Indonesia. They are primarily going to be mammal eaters. They don't really eat much in the way of reptiles. They'll eat rodents, possums, sometimes the occasional bird. And just like in the first video, these snakes, especially when they're smaller, are going to be vulnerable to a huge number of predators, large monitor lizards, other larger snakes, birds of prey, dingoes, uh, invasive animals like rats and feral cats. All these snakes today are listed as least concern. None of them are in danger of going extinct in the wild. Some of them might have populations declining in certain territories, but by the IUCN listings, none of them are in anywhere near in danger of going extinct. Another thing these snakes all share are those thermosensory labial pits along the jaw, which we talked about in the boa versus python video. And these snakes are all semi-arboreal to arboreal. For the most part, they don't spend a whole lot of time on the ground, but again, this depends on their habitat and their range and things like that. These are some of the most gorgeous snakes that I have and there's about six to eight subspecies depending on where you go some sites don't recognize certain subspecies first up we're going to talk about one of the probably most ideal typical looking carpet pythons this is Medusa she's one of my oldest animals and my second oldest snake she's about 14 years old and probably around six feet or so I was told she's a coastal carpet python but there's probably something else somewhere in there she also kind of looks like a southern carpet because of her age, her colors have really dulled over time. When you have a one-year-old carpet python, the color is going to be a lot brighter and more stunning than when you have kind of a senior carpet python. Carpet pythons are found just about in every corner of the continent. They really heavily favor the northern and southernmost edges, though, and then also eastern Australia. The only place they really avoid is the majority of central Australia, which is where all the major deserts are. They really don't like it that hot and arid. They grow anywhere from five to nine feet and they live in a huge variety of habitats ranging from tropical rainforests to semi-arid grasslands. The carpet python was first described in 1804, but most of the subspecies wouldn't be described until the 1980s, but more on that in a second. They have your typical kind of python body layout, kind of a widened skull, narrower neck. They're not overly thick, but they do have a lot of muscle to them because remember they're semi-arboreal. Now over here in New York or the Northeast, nine times out of 10 when a snake wanders into your garage or your basement or something, it's going to be a garter snake, milk snake, some type of colubrid. Over in Australia, on the other hand, you're going to wind up with something like this. Now that probably sounds terrifying, but remember over in Australia, they have a whole bunch of different dangerous venomous snakes. So carpet pythons are usually really easy to recognize. They have very distinguishable markings and patterns. So they don't really get confused with venomous snakes very often. So I mean, 
if you think about it, find, going into your basement or garage and finding like a nine foot carpet python wrapped around your lawnmower unexpectedly is probably a lot less alarming than finding like a six foot tiger snake. Now this is a patterning and coloration you will not see in the wild. This is specific in captivity. Dakon here is what we call a jaguar carpet python because of that bright yellow with the black kind of spotted and splotches. And this is a snake that has been inbred for a few generations to get this really bright, bright yellow. And that means he has what we call a wobble, which means he doesn't have 100% control of his head. Sometimes like you just saw, he does these weird kind of loop-de-loop -loop kind of little mental type ticks that he can't control his head 100%. Hi. There's a few other genetic morphs and other species that have this in captivity from this inbreeding. The most popular one I could probably think of is the spider ball python. I've never worked with them. I've only worked with these guys, but he's actually Dakon Jr. Uh, a few years ago, I had a five foot adult jaguar carpet python. He was about five or six years old and he was Dakon original. And he had the worst wobble that I have ever seen in really any of those types of snakes. And the previous owner said that she actually got it, I think for free from the breeder because the wobble was just so bad. So, I mean, again, this snake would not survive in the wild because he would not be able to camouflage very well. And with that head wobble, I mean, like I said, 99% of the time he's in pretty good control of his head, but Every once in a while he gets that weird loop-de-loop -loop like you saw. And there's a few different kinds of jaguar carpet pythons that have either been bred with other subspecies of carpets or other more. So there's a coastal jaguar carpet python, there's a jungle jaguar carpet python, and I've said it a few times before, I am not a morph guy. I don't really pay attention to morphs. I couldn't tell you. I was told this was a jungle jaguar carpet python, but again, not 100% sure. In the wild, jungle carpets are actually the subspecies with the smallest mainland distribution of any of the subspecies. They're really only found in one small area in the super northeast coast of Australia, which is just dominated by tropical rainforests. Jungle carpets are super popular in captivity. They're really what people kind of picture when they think of a carpet python with that patterning and the colors, but really just about all of the carpet python subspecies are pretty popular. The only ones I could think of off the top of my head that wouldn't be and are still kind of pricey would be Darwin carpet pythons, which are kind of a smaller one you find in Northern Australia. And then the subspecies we're gonna talk about next. I actually got the con from a friend of mine who also does reptile rescue and she got it directly from the breeder. He was rehoming it for super cheap because he didn't want to charge full price because he's actually got a giant kind of concave in his spine right here. Now it doesn't hurt him any. He's already two and a half years old so he's been living with it for a while. It's just a spinal deformity and he's still been eating. He still gets food passed and everything. I think it just happened when he was in the eggs. So he's just another one of those little handicapped kind of reptiles that I use in my programs to educate with. Last up for the true carpet pythons is a species that was at the top of my reptile dream list for a very, very long time. It was number one, I've wanted one for years. I got to hold an adult one when I was in Australia and I was just immediately just in awe of how gorgeous it was and how different it was. So I wanted one for a very, very long time. I'm not gonna handle her yet because I've only had her for a couple months. She's still very tiny, they're very fragile. So next up, the diamond python. Diamond carpet pythons, or just diamond pythons as they're usually called, are only found along the southeastern edge of Australia, from the, kind of the southern border of Queensland down through New South Wales, and then into the, about the northern edge of Victoria. This is actually where I was during my time there. Sydney and Canberra, where I stayed, are in the southern edge of these guys' range. Diamond pythons are actually the southernmost carpet python subspecies. Now, Australia isn't warm and tropical all the time, or even all across the continent. Down in New South Wales, they can actually get some pretty cold winters, which is where, again, where I stayed and where these guys are found. So when I went, it was actually their winter. I went when it was summer over here in New York and it was winter over there. Now, it's not as cold as winters we would get here in the Northeast or Southern Canada. I mean, but I mean, it still got pretty chilly. During the mornings when I was biking to work, it was like 20 to 30 degrees Fahrenheit, and then it would warm up to a max of like, 50 to 60, maybe 65 on a kind of warm day, which is like spring weather to me. So I was fine. I was walking around in like barely a long sleeve shirt, but the people that live there and especially the wildlife, they were not a fan of that cold. 
Now during this time, the snakes are not out hunting. When my whole time there, I never saw a single wild snake because they were all sleeping. They started waking up soon after I left. They're all in their hidey holes waiting for spring to come. While most carpet python subspecies have either banding or stripes or almost a lava lamp-like patterning down the body, diamond pythons are a completely different beast. Diamond pythons have these dark black rings around each scale that come together in this almost tapestry of kind of beads that go down the body with these white or yellow splotches that also run down the body. And these colors and patterns can be pretty variable. Uh, some might have a golden or greenish hue. Uh, sometimes they'll have bigger or more splotches, but they're all absolutely stunning snakes. I got this little cutie from a breeder and she still doesn't have a name yet, but I got it from a breeder that was getting out of diamond carpet python breeding. And I got her for a very, very good price. And I got her right at the tail end of last year. And apparently one of the parents is from San Diego Zoo stock, which is pretty cool. But yeah, I can't wait for her to get bigger for that dark to kind of spread out and just get that really gorgeous diamond-like patterning. Now, despite this looking exactly like a carpet python and even having carpet python in a few of the names, this is not in Morelia spilota. It's not a subspecies or in the same species as the carpet python. This is Morelia bredley, which is the bredley python. Bredley python, bredley carpet python, centralian carpet python. This snake's got more than a few different names. And this species, like I said, is not the carpet python species, even though they look similar. And because of that, it was actually counted as a carpet python subspecies until 1984, when it was first described as its own species. This species, however, despite looking really similar to carpet pythons, is actually severely isolated. It's really only found in a few pockets in the mountainous regions of the southern edge of the Northern Territory. If we go back to that carpet python species range map, you'll see that in the middle, where really none of the other carpet pythons occur naturally, is where this dude hangs out. There is no overlap, not even the inland carpet python goes as far inland as these guys. So there is no natural hybridizing, but in captivity, of course, since these basically are so similar genetically to carpet pythons, there is crossbreeding. One of the main ones that I could think of off the top of my head is a Diamond X Bredley Python. Unlike the vibrant yellows and blacks and golds of carpet pythons, the Bredley Python, on the other hand, has this rustic orangey brown blackish base coloration with lighter whitish or tan highlights down the body. They get about six to nine or so feet long grain, and most of those longer lengths are in captivity, and they are a little bit thicker bodied than the carpet python species. They hang out in very arid desert regions where it's very hot and stays very dry. They tuck away in rocky outcroppings and giant boulders. I got Roku at the very first ever White Plains Reptile Expo I went to a couple years ago. And when I got him, he was already much bigger than the diamond python that you saw. He was about two or so feet long and I actually got him. He was in one of those cake trays you get from a grocery store and it was all taped up. And I made the mistake on the way home of letting him hang out on the dashboard because I thought it was really cool and he could warm up and stuff. But I wasn't quite paying attention and then he actually managed to wrap a single loop around the underside of my seat when I had him in my hands. And then it just, it was over from there. He got wrapped up underneath the seat we had to pull over at a mcdonald's pop the seat out get him out it was just a very annoying difficult mess and now we have another one of my dream snakes that i was very lucky to cross off a few years ago it is probably my favorite species of snake and I love it so much I actually designed it with my logo. This is the green tree python. They're a fairly slim, fully arboreal python that gets about three to six feet depending on where you are in their range. And they're found throughout the rainforests of Northern Australia, Papua New Guinea, Southern Indonesia. And they have this stunning, bright, vivid green, which is where they get their name because they're green and they live up in the trees. We're not very original when it comes to naming most animals. But when they're born, they actually don't start out with this bright green. For sometimes up to the first year of their life, they have this really, really bright, impossible to miss yellow with some reddish, purplish kind of stripes and spotted highlights. You also find some maroonish red young ones with kind of whitish greenish spots, but this seems to be more of like a captive bred thing and hasn't really been observed in the wild yet. But I mean, we don't really see a whole lot of this snake in the wild, so it might be out there. 
And they have this bright coloration to mimic venomous snakes, like little venomous tree vipers and things, so that predators will be less inclined to eat them. And then as they grow older, they kind of lose that yellow. You can see Jade still has it here on her side, but then they get dominated by this bright green that comes in. And Jade actually, throughout her body, it's hard to see on the camera, but Jade has these bright, really faint blue highlights all the way from the tip of her nose down to the tip of her tail, and it is absolutely stunning. And another cool thing that happens, more so in captivity, I don't know if there's ever been any documented case of it in the wild, but in captivity you can get a hybrid between a green tree python and a carpet python called a carpondro. It is an absolutely stunning snake. It takes some of the best things about both snakes and combines them. It is absolutely beautiful. And like I said, this definitely happens in captivity. I don't know if it's ever happened in the wild, at least that we have seen. It might because green tree pythons and some carpet python subspecies do share some some range overlapping, but I don't know. Another cool thing that green tree pythons do that almost no other snakes do is how they sit on a branch, which doesn't sound like it'd be a very cool thing, but what they do is on a branch, they're going to droop themselves back and forth and they're only going to really wrap around the base of their tail to hold on. And this way it maximizes their strike distance. So from sitting position, camouflage, prey doesn't see them, they can reach out, get the food really quickly without having to worry about uncoiling themselves around a branch. And the only other snake that does this, to our knowledge, is the emerald tree boa from South America, which is also a bright green arboreal snake species. And this is an example of convergent evolution where two different animals evolve to kind of occupy the same ecological niche, which we talked about back in our very first ever YouTube video where we talk about leaf frogs. I got Jade and Medusa, the first carpet python we talked about from a friend of a friend that was getting out of reptile. So I went over and picked up the reptiles and supplies and stuff she had left. And I adopted some out, like they had a ball python and a Russian tortoise and stuff. But Jade and Medusa are the two that are still with me. And Jade is actually a little bit older than Medusa. Medusa, I think we said was 14 years old. She's somewhere around there. Jade is probably pushing 16, which makes her my oldest snake. And remember, she's kind of old. She's up there for snakes. Snakes usually only live 20 to 25, usually. But she doesn't go to as many pro programs anymore, but she's still an absolutely gorgeous, gorgeous snake, and uh, yeah, I'm just very happy to have her. So those are my snakes that make up the genus Morelia. Comment down below which Australian reptile is your favorite. Like the video if you learned something. Subscribe so you don't miss out on any of our future videos. Like eventually I'll get around to doing Into the Wild Australia Part 3 and some of the other continents we got to get around to. Thanks for tuning in and I'll catch you later. This is actually where I was. Woo! This is where these guys are found and where. Woo! <laughs> I got it from a breeder who's getting out of. Woo! <laughs> You are a little spitfire. This is the way.